All right, cool. Let's get started. Uh, so today we'll be uh, reviewing the second midterm. Um, a lot of people told us it was a lot harder than the last one, so that wasn't our intention. We were trying to write it easier, but um, I think it's clear that we didn't. But but actually, like when we ended up grading it, the final grade, uh, I think last time the average was 65 percent, and this time the average was 63 percent. So it wasn't actually uh, all that much worse. So. Again, like last time, we, we set a heavy curve, so 75 and up was an A, and you can see the other grades here. Um, so if you have a low score, you don't need to uh, panic unless it's on unless perhaps on the uh, very low end of the spectrum and you're trying to get um, a higher grade in the course. So, I mean, if you're, if you're concerned about it, you, we should definitely, definitely talk. So I don't have a lot of other stats for now because I was actually facing a lot of time pressure uh, grading the exam, so you, you should pity me that this I had uh, time pressure with this. But... Um, yeah, so sorry about that. So over the weekend, I'll be getting more stats, basically, on how everybody uh, is currently like ranking in the course and stuff. So you can uh, uh, still have some time to try to change anything if, if you aren't happy with what the grade with the grade you're headed towards. Um, so okay, so let's go over over some questions, and people could uh, ask questions and whatever. Uh, but the only thing I would ask is that if you have a question that's very specific to your exam, uh, just ask me afterwards. Or if you have a question that you think is of general interest, uh, jump right in. So does anybody have any general questions before we go, go question by question? Okay. So here's the exam. Mm. Okay, so this first question is just asking what if we what if we change the disk API? So instead of being able to issue a request that involves multiple blocks at a time, what if we can now only issue a single block at a time? And if, if, if you did not have, uh, if you had like a large disk buffer, like this probably wouldn't really matter, right? Because I could, instead of doing this one big request, I could, I could just do a bunch of small requests and those would all get, uh, those requests would get uh, queued in the disk and then it could still do it sequentially, right? But one of the things we added here to kind of make the question less ambiguous is we could say that the disk can only service one request at a time, right? So there's really no way that you can do exactly the same thing with uh, this request as you can with this request, right? So, okay, so how does this perform for random writes? Well, in that case, it doesn't really matter, right? Because, I mean, it depends on how you define uh, random writes, but, like, one definition would be that it's just a single block at a time, right? So, I mean, if you went with another definition, I, I, I was fine and I graded it accordingly. But if you assume that random uh, I.O. is just doing one, one block right at a time, that doesn't really matter between these. But where it does really matter is for... Uh, sequential writes, right? Because you could imagine a situation, just imagine with a single desk, in between here we have to interrupt the OS and the OS has to issue another request. And it's possible that if that takes too long, you could, uh, the disk could end up doing a full rotation, right? So you could do very I.O., very slow I.O., where the disk just has to rotate every time, right? So, and, and you can't really know for sure, right? Because if you're manufacturing a disk, you don't know how slow the machine will be that uh, that you're uh, deploying it with. And I think uh, other people, like maybe like a couple people had a, an answer that I really liked and they said, well, what if this interface is on top of a RAID, right? I mean, now this is very slow, right? Because we can't take advantage of writing to both, uh, uh, both disks at the same time. So anybody have any, any questions on that question? All right. So then uh, we had a question about seeks. Uh, so the seek, the, the main idea here, right, is we were trying to get you com to compare and contrast the uh, the file system seek and the disk seek. And I think most of the people who remember what lseek is um, did fine on this. I think I saw a lot of things where people were just making up stuff like they said it would like s was searching the disk or something or or things like that. I mean, I guess that's a reasonable guess if you uh, didn't remember what it does. But basically, this is just setting the the offset in the file descriptor, right? So this is just changing something in memory, nothing on disk. And so this won't cause any disk seeks unless you do an I.O. after that, right? So this should not be causing any seeks. Um, other things people said is they said you could use this to get the um, current position of, of the file descriptor, uh, the point at which it would next read or write, and that's perfectly correct, right? I mean, in addition to setting it, it returns the current thing. Um, and you could also use this to seek to the end and get the size of the file. So I was, I was kind of generously accepting any of these answers, right? So the question, answer then is that it's not really re related to the disk seeks directly. Uh, it's only really related if you do an I.O. after the LC, and then that may or may not cause a, a disk seek. 
And then why doesn't the disk require a seek call as part of the API? Uh, I mean, you could certainly imagine doing this, right? You could imagine a disk that would expose uh, it, it's an internal geometry, and then a file system could be aware of that, and it could tell the disk exactly where to seek and when to start uh, reading or writing. Um, but it doesn't require that because all of that, all of that knowledge is built right into the disk firmware, right? So when we want to read or write to the disk, we just say, uh, read this logical address or write that logical address, and then the, the disk takes of all care of all that for us, right? So um, some people went so far to say is that this this API could never uh, never be useful. Um, and I mean, I guess I didn't really take any points off for that, but I think that's a little bit of a strong statement, right? Because you could imagine, um, for one simple case, right, you could imagine if there's not currently any IOs outstanding on the disk, you could imagine telling it to seek to a certain place where you think IO is most likely to occur next, right? You might know some files are hotter than others, so you might prefer that if there's nothing to do, your, your disk head is just sitting there. Just like, say, like in a building, you might prefer that if there, your elevator is idle, you might prefer it sits on a certain floor, right? So I wouldn't go so far to say it's useless, uh, but it's certainly not required given uh, the other calls of the API. Any questions on that? Okay. So renames, I think uh, this is kind of sad, but the uh, vast majority of people got this at least somewhat wrong. So I guess I didn't emphasize that enough in class. I went over it again yesterday, and I'll go over it again now to just try, try to drive home the point. So I'm, let me just, uh, I made some slides yesterday for this. I'm going to run through these again to illustrate. Okay, so here's the idea of the atomic update. We want to update a file, say foo.txt, and if we crash, we either want to get all of the old data or all the new data. So our general strategy is that we're going to write a new copy of the file with the changes to some temporary location like foo.temp, and then we're going to rename that over the original. So here would be an example of a bad protocol that kind of follows that general strategy. If we copy foo.txt to foo.temp and then just do a rename, uh, well, what could happen? Well, let's look. So here we have uh, a path name, foo.txt, pointing to a file. And so, I mean, this is kind of a simple picture, right? Because internally what, what, what it would really look like is that foo.txt is pointing to an inode, which is pointing to a bunch of data blocks. But I kind of have uh, bundled the inode and all the data blocks just under this old data thing. And so that's on disk, right? The, our old version of the file was safely on disk. And so the first thing we would do is we would copy foo.txt to foo.temp with our changes, right? And that's just going to probably get write buffered, right? So that, that may be in RAM, okay? So now, if the next thing you do is if you do the rename, it's possible, I mean, not every file system will do this, but the file system has a choice of persisting that path name change on disk before it persists the data block change, right? So if you crash at a bad time, you could actually end up uh, uh, with a case where you switch to the new file, but the new file contains garbage, right? So that's not what you want. You want to force the file system to flush the new data out first. So the way you, you would do that is in between your copy and your rename, you would just do an f-sync, right? So in this case, we're pointing to old data, Point to new data, make that new data be on disk, and then do the atomic rename, and then, then we're safe, right? And, and actually, uh, the other thing to keep in mind here, so this, this alone by itself is an atomic update, but this does not guarantee that if you crash after this, you'll get the new data, right? Because one of the possibilities is that this directory entry might not get flushed, the directory entry might get flushed to disk later, right? So that could still be pointing to the old data if we crash. Right? So if you really wanted to make this not only atomic, but durable, after the second rename, you'd also have to do an f-sync on, on the directory containing foo.txt. So I mean, that's just a, the site. I didn't expect anybody to say that on the, on the test because I wasn't asking for a durable update. I was just asking for an atomic update. Right? So let me head back to the exam. Okay, so that's basically what I was looking for. I was looking for you to say, I was hoping you would see, see f-sync. I mean, others, the read and write for the copy are kind of uh, more obvious. But one, one thing that bothered me is a lot of people said that before the rename, let's do an onlink on the old file, right? I mean, that would definitely be, uh, um, I mean, well, it's already not atomic, but I mean, that'd make it even less atomic, right? Because then there's a point in time when nothing, that path points to nothing, right? So that'd be a bad time to crash. So you certainly should not be doing an onlink before the rename. The rename will automatically remove that old file that it used to be pointing to. Um, 
so yeah, so I, I think like if people missed the F-sync, I would give most points if they kind of went into detail and explained what was going on in general. But I mean, if you missed the F-sync and you didn't say much, then I think you lost a lot of points. So any, any questions on that before we go to part B? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so, so why not do on link? So let me, let me go back to the slides here quick and try to illustrate. Right, so I mean, if you did an on link, what is that doing? That means before, so I want to switch from here to here atomically, right? What you're doing if you do an on link first is you delete that, right? So I mean, this would be a very bad time to crash, right? Because now if I crash, it doesn't point to either data, right? So you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to do that on link. Yeah, so the rename does that, but the rename does an onlink and link atomically. If you just call onlink by itself, then it's not atomic. Oh. Right, so internally it needs to do kind of an onlink and a relink, but you want to, I mean, the file yeah. system guarantees that it will be atomic. So it's going to use a journal or some other mechanism to make sure that you don't get in a state where you onlink and then link first. But if you do it yourself in user space, then, then it's broken, right? Because then you could crash in between your system calls. Other questions on that? That's a good question, right? Because a lot, a lot of people have the similar answer, right, about the onlink. Hmm. Okay, so I guess people had a few different answers for this. Uh, well, what was actually strange is people would like write a lot of code, and you don't have to write any code, right? All it says is design a new file system API. So it's just kind of this, defining a function or an interface that you might use uh, to do the atomic update, right? Uh, so, so we mentioned that applications uh, have to do a lot of work, right? There's a lot of effort from the application. And I guess, so a lot of people interpreted this as that they have to do a lot of system calls. So they would propose something that, let's just create a wrapper around all these other functions that will do the copy and everything for us, right? So I mean, I think I gave most points for that, but I mean, it wasn't really what I was looking for. What I was hoping people would say, and, and a few people did say, is that, well, this is pretty expensive, right? This that we have to copy our whole file before we can do our update, right? I mean, what if I have a 100 megabyte file and I'm trying to update one byte in it, right? Now that's very expensive, right? I'm doing uh, a million times more work than I should have to, right? So what I really wish would happen is that the file system would just expose some interface where I could say like, apply these changes to the file and use your journal or whatever you, else you have internally, just make sure that either all of these changes apply or none of them apply, right? So you could imagine a lot of different interfaces like that. Uh, a fair number of people said that the interface is going to be exactly the same as the right system call, and but we'll just add an, add an additional guarantee that it's atomic, right? And that I was fine with that. That got full credit, right? Uh, of course, I mean that wasn't the best answer because you might imagine cases where you want to update different parts of the file at the same time. So, for example, what if your file is a list of integers, and kind of the first integer should be the sum of all other integers, right? I might want to update something in the middle and at the beginning at the same time, right? So very few people came up with an interface that um, will let you do that, but I was very happy when they did, right? So I mean, uh, different things you could do. One is that you could have a write system call that takes an array of updates, right? So right now the, the write system call takes, uh, well, say like pwrite will take an offset a buffer and a length, right? You could imagine having an array of those things, right? And then I could update different things at the same time. Or I think uh, one person even came up with an interface where you could say something like start a transaction and it would return kind of a new handle to you and then you could apply a bunch of updates like that and then when you were all done you could do a system call that say apply all these updates at the same time. So I thought that was, uh, that was my favorite uh, interface. But I think only like one, one person did that. So, any questions on this? So it's unfortunate, right? We don't have a better interface right now, so it's actually doing atomic updates on your files is very slow in Unix, unless you build a lot of machinery yourself on top of it. Any questions? Okay. Hmm, the semaphore question. So, uh, basically this is saying that, so normally, right, the semaphore has a counter associated with it, and if that counter is positive, one way you could think of that is that that's the number of signals queued, right? I mean, of course, there are no, we don't have to queue signals because it's not, there's nothing to remember about them. We just have to remember the, how many there are waiting. And if it's negative, that, that means that's how many threads are on the wait queue. 
right? So this is a little bit tricky because now we're saying that it's always initialized to one, right? So there's like kind of one signal that somebody could eat and then no more, right? But it always has to be initialized to one. So a lot of people said, well, uh, this is a little bit more restrictive because if it's initialized to one, that's what we do when we want it to be uh, act like a mutex, right? Where we just want mutual exclusion. And, and that's totally correct. And uh, it, like this, if, if you just default to one, right, then it's harder to have something that behaves kind of like a condition variable where you wake somebody up after some event happens. Uh, and then, then also people talked about the producer and consumer, of course, right? It's harder, uh, let's say I have a buffer and I want my semaphore to represent how many, uh, how many uh, entries in my buffer are ready to be consumed. It, it's hard to do that, right? So I would have some points if people... Uh, pointed that out, but what I was uh, really made me happy is when people said, well, I could build this old interface on top of this new interface by first just creating like this, and then if I wanted, wanted it to be zero, I could just do a sim wait right away, and if I wanted to be something more, I could call sim post a lot of times, right? So people would say, okay, we could do this hacky thing and make it work like the old thing, so they're actually equally powerful, the new one is just less convenient, right? Or, or you might even say in some ways uh, it's less powerful because it would be slower for the producer consumer, right? If I had to call uh, sim post immediately a bunch of times. All right, so that's kind of what I was looking for there. So any questions on that part? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I asked what the disadvantages would be. Well, I mean, if you just say, if, if, if you say that a disadvantage is that I can't use this to signal somebody to wake them up. Well, well, I disagree with that, right? Because you could do that, right? So I mean, uh, yeah. So if you, if you say it's hard to do that or you have to do a little more work, then that's a better answer. So other questions? OK. So then the next part is that you just had to build a simple block API for use for a semaphore. So I think most people got most, most of the points on that. Uh, but, but we can just work through it quick uh, so we're all on the same page. Let me head over here. Mm. Code.c. Right, so I don't really need a lot, a lot of state here. Uh, but so I need, to have, I need to have something here. So I mean, I can just have my semaphore. Oh, so a very, very common mistake that I, I would take a point off for, and it kind of made me sad, is that a lot of people would say this. And then they would never allocate space for it, right? I mean, that's uh, like, uh, I mean, make sure you don't do that, right? I mean, if you if you have a pointer type, you have to do an allocate at some point. Uh, so I mean, just because you're, the functions you're calling you need to take a pointer doesn't mean that you should be initializing a pointer, right? You can always take the address of something with the ampersand and do it that way, right? So I, yeah, so I mean, I mean, maybe I should have taken off more points for that, but I would just take off one. But I mean, that's definitely uh, you need to be more careful about that. Right, so anyway, let's not do that. Let's do it like that. Uh, and, and this is actually faster, right? Because I don't have to like worry about corner cases where alloc, malloc might fail, right? So I mean, this is definitely better code than even, even if I did remember to do malloc, it's definitely better to do it this way than to have a pointer. But anyway, so I can, uh, what do I want to do here? I want to initialize it, and I would want something like that, right? And then p shared, I don't, uh, I can do it just like this, right? I'll just use a new interface. And this is just whether or not the mutex is shared uh, with, with other processes. And we didn't really talk about that, so I didn't really care what people, uh, what people put there. Um, so then for acquire, uh, so this acquire, I mean, we might have to block sometimes, right? So that this is very much just like a sim wait. Right, so I can grab this guy again. Right, and then the, the release is basically a sim post, right? So one of the people who was blocking on acquire can wake up and run. Right, so I think most people got that. Any questions on that one? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean I guess you could, I mean if it fails you could just return whatever that is failing. Is that good? I think I, uh, I don't know why I didn't put that there to start with. I wasn't, it wasn't really what I was trying to ask about. Okay. So here is our API. Oh, okay, so the, the, so the raid question. Right, so I, I think most people got this, right? The, the idea is that on both the raid 4 and raid 5, you have parity, and if you're doing 
a small write. So you might have the small write problem, right, where you have to read your, let's say you're just trying to write one block. In order to update the parity, you have to figure out what the parity used to be and also what your data block used to be. So for both RAID 4 and RAID 5, you have to read your block, read your parity, write your block, write your parity. Right? So you're kind of doing the same amount of work. The reason RAID 5 is faster is that we rotate our parity. Right? So you can do, I mean, these, these small writes are very expensive in both RAID 5 and RAID 4, but at least in RAID 5 you can do many of them in parallel. Right? So this is just all about the small write problem and how uh, uh, RAID 5 at least lets us do it more parallelly. Any questions on that? Pardon? Most people got that. Okay. Oh, so and then this this gets stripe size, right? So I mean, this is still kind of related to the same thing, the small write problem, uh, right? This, it's, it's it's slow because we have to do all the reads and then all the writes. But you could imagine, let's say I have four disks, one of which is parity. If I'm writing, say tw three blocks at a time, then that means I know what my new parity is without bothering to read anything before, right? So in that case, I can kind of get full speed, right, where I just write to all my data blocks and, and my parity block at the same time. And uh, that will basically, uh, I think that will they would double my performance in relative to what would happen if I had to do the read and then the write. Uh, so basically, the idea here, right, is that we want to write a whole stripe at a time. So it would be nice if higher layers of the stack knew that, right? So it would be nice if the file system uh, could know that, so the file system could try to uh, do writes of a particular size, right? So you could come up with any idea that uh, for how the file system might uh, utilize that. So for example, for FFS, you might say, well, let's try to make our block block size be that. Or also, say for FFS, uh, FFS can expose to the user what the ideal write size is, right? So you could imagine that the file system could call this on RAID, and then the file system could return this up to the user, and then user space, which is probably using the standard I.O. library for buffering, might use the buffer size that's equal to the stripe size. Right, so I think that was the general answer I was kind of fishing for there. Uh, some people had some other interesting ideas where you could, if you knew the stripe size and you also knew the type of RAID, which I didn't really say you know, but if you knew the type of RAID, then you could compute which logical blocks would be going to the same desk, right? You could kind of infer the layout. And if you did that, you could imagine doing something where I'm gonna, if I want, if I have a small file that goes over several blocks, I could try to lay it out so it uses blocks that are not adjacent to each other logically in the RAID, but you could try to lay them out so that all the, uh, all the blocks of that file were stored on the same disk, right? And that might be faster. And I hadn't really thought of that, but I thought it was kind of an interesting, um, interesting idea, so I would give points for that. <coughs> Any questions on that one? Okay. Mm. So this was this is a question, basically, uh, an example straight out of the book. So hopefully, if you read the the book carefully, this isn't a very easy question for you. So basically, what's going on here? I, I actually changed it a little bit because like the the book seemed a little bit wrong. But basically, so we have uh, allocate here, and, and normally like malloc would fail, right? If there's no if there's no memory available. But what this one's trying to do is it's trying to wait until somebody frees enough memory, right? So malloc will just be slow. It'll block until there's enough, uh, enough space available, right? So we have this condition wait. So the problem here is that this signal, uh, it, it wakes up at most one thread, right? I mean, if there's many threads waiting, it'll choose one of them and wake it up. If there's no threads waiting, it won't wake anybody up, right? So can alloc ever, uh, ever wait even after a large enough piece of memory is freed? So I mean, some people kind of said, well, yes, because maybe there's two people waiting, and then you free something, and then one of them gets it, and the other one keeps waiting. So I, I think I would uh, give like some points for that, but I mean, that's like not really uh, addressing the heart of the question, right, and seeing how this code is fundamentally broken, right? So I'd give some points, but not all. What I was really looking for is, is that you would say that it's possible, let's say somebody's waiting for 100 and somebody's waiting for 200, if you free 100, you might wake up the guy who's waiting for 200, right? And then they both keep up on waiting, and even though there's enough memory for somebody to make progress, nobody makes progress, right? So an example like that would be very nice. Um, other types of examples people gave is, let's say I have 10 threads waiting, and they're all waiting for a small piece of memory, and a very large piece of memory gets freed, uh, maybe I should be waking them all up so they can all 
Uh, you could imagine splitting that piece of memory so they could all run, right? So if you said something like that, then you would get full, full points on this part. So would broadcast help? Well, what does broadcast do? Instead of waking up at most one thread, it wakes up all the threads that are waiting, right? So this would, this would definitely help, right? And I mean, this is kind of a hint to uh, this question, too. So I mean, I, I feel like they should almost be easier uh, given that they're asked together, right? So broadcast would definitely help here. What is the disadvantage of always um, using broadcast instead of signal? Well, I mean, it's always going to be correct. It's going to be a correct thing to do. But it'll be pretty slow, right? Especially if I have hundreds of threads and I only really want to wake up one of them. Right? So, I mean, imagine in the producer-consumer, right? We only want to wake up, uh, if we only fill one thing, we only want to wake up one thread, right? So, uh, broadcast is pretty wasteful uh, in the general case, even though there's cases where it is needed, right? So, most people got the C. Uh, C part. I was puzzled when people um, would say broadcast does not help here, and then also say broadcast is slower. So I mean, I don't know. Like, if, I don't know if, if this isn't a case where you could use broadcast. I don't know where you, where else you would think of using it. Um, so, any questions on this one? Okay. Mm, escaping the deadly brace. So that was Dijkstra's name for deadlock. Uh, so no preemption is one of the necessary conditions for deadlock. Uh, so one of the ways you can build, build preemption is that, I mean, you could kind of write the code for it, right? If I acquire lock A, uh, then I could use a try lock when I'm trying to get B, and then if, if that fails, I could release A, right? So kind of if I can't get what I want, well, I give up what I have so that somebody else can get what they want, right? So that we, we basically describe that here, and then we're saying, uh, can this ever live lock? And if so, give an example. So the example would basically be, so, so ultimately you're trying to get several locks, right? So the example would be if you have, it, have that in a loop, and basically whenever a try lock fails, you release all your locks and then go back to the head of the loop and try again, right? So I think this was an example, again, straight out of um, the book. The problem is that, right, uh, you could imagine thread one gets A and then thread gets two gets B, and then they both do their try locks, both of which um, may fail, and then they both release A and B and then try again, right? So you could imagine if you got unlucky with the scheduling, uh, you could just get stuck there. You look, you look unhappy. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh huh. I guess you could imagine. Uh, you'd have to think about it. I mean, there might be a case where it could happen, right? Where. I mean, let's say like the, the scheduler always tries to context switch after a lock or for whatever reason, uh, maybe because it has to uh, get some OS support anyway, right? You could imagine some case where you got in a bad stride pattern. I mean, it probably wouldn't happen, right? But I mean, uh, when we're thinking about concurrency, right, we have to think about the worst possible uh, scheduler, right? So, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's unlikely, I think, in general, I would agree with you. So, other questions on this? Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> so then, okay, so we asked, so we're basically asking here if, if try lock provides a fundamental feature not available with normal locks, and, and if so, argue why, otherwise, like, you have to uh, build a try lock. And, and what was actually interesting to me is a lot of people said that I could build a try lock if you gave me an atomic primitive, like compare and swap or test and set or something like that, uh, which I agree with. Uh, but, but the correct way to think about that is to realize that once you have locks, right, if I have mutexes, I can kind of build any of these other, uh, I can, I don't need hardware support to build a compare and swap. I can build my own compare and swap in software if, I, if you give me locks, right? I mean, I can use compare and swap to build locks. I can use locks to build compare and swap, right? So a lot of people say it's not possible, but um, once, once you made that, made that first observation, you should have realized that it is possible, right? So I mean, all the ways you could have just like played with the code more and seen it, um, so, so it's actually not, not that complex, right? So kind of what we want to do is that we need to make sure that, well, let me, let me go over to the code. Uh, so this is code two. So, so kind of what we need to do is we need to make sure that neither of these calls ever block for a while, right? While, while you're doing work, right? So I mean, it's okay if we can do some synchronization inside of here, right? Otherwise, I, we wouldn't have said build it on top of locks, right? We have to use locks in here somehow. But basically, there should be no locks held, held when these functions return, right? So ultimately, what we want to do is we want all these things to return immediately, and we just want them to return 
were you the first one to acquire the Trilock? Or are you not the first person to call this? Right? So this is actually not too bad. What we can do is we can say uh, we can have a, a lock state. And then we also have to have a mutex, right? Well, let me, let me actually get this. This is got jumbled and I copied and pasted. OK, and then I also I want my mutex. And I'm going to make that that style. OK, and I, I'm not going to write this here. For, well, actually, I might as well, right? Mm. That. So I'm going to do some initialization down here, and I'm going to do some acquire and release down here. But let's just write init for now. So for init, what do we want to do? We want to do t, and then oh, what did I write here? That's not no good. Okay, that's what I want. All right. So I'll init my mutex, and then also the state of the lock should initially be unlocked, right? Okay, so basically what I want to do here now is I kind of want to atomically check the state, right? So I'm going to grab the old state here and all right, so I'm, I have some locks here. And, and basically, well, what I'm going to do is, is first off, I'm going to make sure after the try lock returns, the state had better be locked, right? But what I also want to do is I want, I want whoever is calling this to know whether or not they were the one who locked it or if it just already happened to be locked. Right? So I'm going to save that old state. Oops. Ah. So I'm going to save that old state. Right? And then I think, I forget what, what the exact instructions were, but we, I think it was return negative one if somebody else has it or return zero if you got it. So I mean, I can just return kind of the opposite of the old state here. Right? So I'm, I'm making sure it's locked, and then I'm figuring out if I was the one who locked it or if somebody else had, had it. Right? And then uh, the, the release case is pretty simple. Right? I just have to, uh, I can just set the state to zero. Right? So no, nobody's ever going to be blocking for a long time while somebody else holds the try lock. Right? But we still have to have a guard of some sort. Any questions on that? All right. Hmm. So the F lock question, a lot of people got mixed up by this a bit. So I mean, one of the key points here, right, is that we have n memory mutex per inode, right? I mean, the inode we have saved on disk, right? But we also, in memory, we're going to have a memory version of that, right? We're going to read it from disk and have a memory structure uh, for that file, and then we could have a, a, a mutex associated with that, right? Okay, so the first thing I did is that I proposed uh, I, I propose that we can build file lock uh, like this instead of having to have a special special call. I mean, this is a good kind of question in general, right? Because if you're building a kernel, you want your kernel to be as simple as possible, right? Because it's easy to have bugs in there. And also just for security, right? You want to kind of have a low, a small attack interface, right? So it's kind of, uh, I mean, you want your kernel interface to be as small as possible, but no smaller, right? So the question is, should flock be part of that interface, or can we uh, can we do do that functionality in user space? That's the way you should kind of be thinking about this question, right? So here's one we could do it in user space, but is that just as good? Uh, so compare the performance of flock a file lock to to flock. Uh, well, basically, I mean, if if I want to do this in user space, I have to make it like a spin lock, right? Which is kind of slow, right? There's no uh, well, I mean, of what we've talked about, there's no interface that really where it'll notify me, hey, uh, this file has changed, right? It, I, can, I can check things in the file system, but the file system never kind of actively interrupts processes. I mean, there's, there actually are interfaces where it does do that, but we haven't talked about it, and I'm certainly not using it here, right? So this is kind of so. This is kind of the best I can do, given the interfaces that we've talked about. Uh, Whereas in the kernel, I have more options, right? I could put the thread to sleep or do whatever, right? I can do anything I want to do, right? So we can build a fundamentally faster F lock in the kernel than I could in user space. So that was the uh, answer I was really looking for. Um, some people would say things that, well, with F lock, I don't really have to create an extra file on 
in my file system and potentially on disk because everything is just in memory uh, with flock but not file lock. And I, I think I was fine with that, right? But it wasn't, I might have written a disgruntled comment, but I don't think I took off um, many, if any, points for that. Uh, so this is an interesting question. Prepare the correctness of file lock to F lock in the case of power loss. Right? So this is interesting, right? So for F lock, we know that it's in memory. So we know that when we boot back up, the lock will not be there. Right? Whereas for file lock, I mean, we're actually writing to the file. So depending on whether or not the write buffer is not flushed, uh, the lock may or may not be on disk when we boot up again. So the way I was thinking about this is that you probably do not want that lock there again when you boot up uh, because then nobody's ever going to release it, right? Everybody will be locked out forever. So I thought that not persisting uh, the lock uh, was a feature instead of a bug, right? And I think that's the way most people would think about it. Some people were viewing uh, persisting the lock as a feature. I don't know, like, in what case you would ever recover then, right, if, if you could never remove the lock. But even drawing with that argument... People would say things like, oh, well, I'm guaranteed that the file will be there with flock, uh, so, uh, so that flock is better. Uh, but even along that reasoning, right, if you think that locking people out forever is good, well, that's not really true, right, because the file lock does not call fsync, so uh, it may or may not be there. So I think in this regard, I think I, I like the behavior of flock better, but what I can, even if you don't, what I can say with certainty is that flock is consistent, behaves in a consistent way, whereas file lock does not. Right, so I can at the very least argue that. Any questions on that? Yeah? I guess there would be an argument to say that you want your locks to persist after a power loss mm -hmm. because you're trying to recover the state that the system was in before. Mm -hmm. um, because that would be completely impossible if you just didn't have your locks that were looked at afterwards. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, file lock is very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you could argue... Well, okay, so file lock is not, so okay, let, let's, I think, okay, so there's two parts to the argument there, right? First, you're arguing that you might want the lock there when you boot back up again, because, so yeah, I could imagine some case, right, where maybe, so if, if the system died while somebody was in the middle of updating some things, right, they, they were trying to do something atomically, so they had this file lock, and then we rebooted, and uh, uh, so the system's in a weird state, right? There's probably some operations we don't want to run right now because they might not be able to deal with the system in a weird state. So you could say maybe that's good that we lock out most threads. And you could maybe go further and say, well, let's say we have a recovery thread that knows we crashed, and that thing will, will fix, the the, fix the files and then delete the file lock. Right? So I think you could make a good argument for that. So I'll agree with that. Um, the reason I would still take off points, though, is because even if that's the behavior you want, file lock does not give that to you, right. right? So no matter what you want, file lock is not good. At least F lock will make some people happy. So I didn't really think of that when I was writing the question. So it's like a little bit harder to defend, but I think I can still argue from there. So any other questions? People happy with that? Okay. Uh, so this is very similar. Uh, <coughs> let's say you have this new OTEMP flag that basically... Uh, means that the file will be kept in memory. Uh, it'll never be persisted on disk. Why might that be useful? Well, it, it, it gives you that exact behavior, right? In this case, if you use this with your file lock, um, then it'll never be persisted to disk, and you can get that consistent behavior just like F lock. Um, other people would say things about performance, and I, I guess I was kind of okay with that, although I was maybe a little bit disgruntled. Uh, but, I mean, that, that's a fine answer, too, right? It's going to be faster. Ah, so, so this is an interesting question, right? So uh, F lock, does F lock support, uh, okay, so F lock supports reader writer locks, the extra flags, and our file lock does not. So the question is, is does that mean F lock is just more convenient, or does it provide a fundamental advantage? Okay, so fundamental advantage means that I can't write a bunch of code using file locks and get the same behavior as the F lock. Okay, so you could either argue that it's, it's, it's a fundamental feature or you could actually try to build it. Uh, well, actually, you didn't have to build it, right? You just had to, like, argue uh, but not write code. So kind of a, an argument that I would be very happy with is if you could say that uh, reader-writer locks have two locks, right? They have the read lock and the write lock, 
and then they also have a counter for the number of readers. And you could say, well, these, these two locks that the reader writer lock uses are just regular locks. So I can use my regular file locks for that. I can just have two file locks. And then for the counter, I mean, the counter is a little bit trickier, right? Because I have to have all process be, processes being able to see that. But I have a file system, right? I can just store that counter in one of my locks or in, in, a, in perhaps another file. Right? So that's kind of what I was looking for there, right? Like to just say that, uh, I mean, since we're just building on top of locks and a counter, I mean, we can do that with our file system. We don't need anything special here. It's just less convenient. Um, some people forgot how to do the reader writer lock, like just a couple people, and they said that reader writer's locks need condition variables, um, and that you can't build a condition variable from a lock, therefore uh, you can't build reader writer locks just with, on top of regular locks. So that's actually wrong, right? Because you don't need a condition variable for the reader writer lock. Uh, but I like that line of reasoning, right? That's the right way to think about systems and their power, so I would actually give a lot of points for that uh, wrong answer. I think I might have only docked like one point for that even. So we could, uh, well, any questions first? We could we could write some pseudocode for the reader writer lock just for review. I think that might be useful. How do you check and create the lock atomically? How do you check and create the lock atomically? You need to check for, like, the, let's say it's the letter lock, so it needs to look to see the mm -hmm. lock's there. And then sure. Okay. So, so, so the reader writer lock is going to have to have a name, and that name is not what I'm going to use for my file lock, right? I'm going to append two different things to that to get two different file names, and so the creation of those other locks is atomic, right? Because file lock is atomic, right? Does that make sense? Let's, let's, let's write out some of the uh, pseudocode, and I think it's easier to think of in that context. Okay? So, so we have this. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of create, I'm not going to have any parameters here. I'm just going to try to create it with one thing so I don't have to like write a bunch of code for string append and stuff like that. Uh, so for file, well, I'm going to do a file unlock here. Uh, so I'll just call this write lock. So this is just kind of pseudocode. I'm not trying to actually try to make this correct. Um, so this is generally what I want here, right? So this is for the write lock. But what I want to do is I want to make sure that the readers uh, block out the writer. If there's at least one reader running, I don't want any writers to run. So I, first off, I need, to, I need to make sure at least one of the readers acquires the write lock, but no more than one, right? Because if, if more than one does it, well, then the readers will block other readers out. So what I really want to do is I want to have a counter uh, of the number of readers. Ah, I can't type today. Okay, so I'm going I'm to keep track of the number of readers, something like this. <coughs> and, and what I can do is I, I can say if I'm the first reader, then I'm also going to acquire this write lock. Okay, and then if I'm the, if I'm the last one, then I'm going to release it. Right? So then I would do a file on that. Okay? But of course, how do I make sure this counter is, uh, is updated atomically, right? Because I could have multiple readers trying to increment this at the same time. So for that purpose, that's where I have to introduce my read lock. Okay? So I'll have a read lock here and an on lock there. Right? And this is just, this is just pseudocode. So what I'm going to say is store counter value in counter file, right? So this is kind of a sketch of, of what a solution might look like, right? I mean, it, it would be painful if I had to do the string append and uh, read and write this. So I'm not going to do that all now, but I think this should be hopefully enough to convince you that it's possible. So any questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. So people actually had a lot of trouble with uh, question nine, hmm. which I, I guess it wasn't meant to be that difficult. It was long, but not uh, supposed to be terribly hard. So okay, so I mean this was a straight out of the book in the lecture, right? So the uh, fast file system comes with a new API that recommends a size for writes. Uh, the recommendation is the block size within FFS. So remember in FFS we have 
kind of two block sizes. We have big blocks and small blocks. The big blocks are just called themselves blocks. The small blocks are called fragments. Uh, and so we're, okay, so the file system is formatted in some way, right? So when somebody does make FFS, they're specifying the fragment size and the block size. And now when a program uses FFS, it's trying to ask FFS, how big is your block size, right? And uh, that's what FFS will return. So one of the libraries that uses this new call is the standard I.O. library. And how does it use it? Uh, well, in a very natural way, right? Standard I.O. just buffers writes before sending them to a file descriptor. And you're going to want to buffer uh, the block size before doing a write. OK? Uh, so then, I mean, the, the next one is kind of elaborating on that. What is the problem if you are basically buffering smaller than the write size and then sending these smaller writes to the file system? So the problem with that, if you recall, is that a file can be storing its data in either blocks or fragments. And it, if it can store data in a full block, it always will. Right? So the tail of the file might be in fragments, but kind of like the bulk of the file, everything before like the last few kilobytes is all going to be in blocks. Right? So what that means is, is if that my, if my file is growing very small, a very, by a very small amount at the time, I may first use some fragments for the tail, and then as the tail grows, it might become a full block. And so at that point, I may have to copy my data from my fragments to a full block. So as I do all these small appends to the file, it'll be very expensive, right? I'll keep having to copy fragments over to blocks, and I, I mean, I could end up doing, uh, well, three times as much I all, right? Instead of just writing my data, I have to write it, then read it back, and then write it another place again, right? So uh, if you use a smaller size, that could get quite expensive. Any questions on that? Kind of intuitive. Okay. Uh, I mean, some people would say things that larger writes are faster in general, right? Because your I.O. is more sequential. And I mean, I guess that's true, right? But I mean, there's kind of a, I mean, it's not asking about that, right? There's kind of a, a specific threshold where uh, it's especially useful to have a bigger write. And you could even imagine it. Like, ha you can't say that's always true, right? I mean, if my block size is 4 kilobytes and I'm writing 5 kilobytes at a time, that will actually be slower than if I was writing 4 kilobytes at a time, right? Yeah, so FFS defines large files as those requiring an indirect block. I mean, so basically what you can figure, figure out here is that the biggest file I can, I can have using just direct pointers is 48 kilobytes. And I'm asking about what's wrong with these files that are just slightly over, over that. So we'll have to use an indirect pointer. And that indirect, that indirect block will be pointing to just one, uh, one block, or actually it would be a fragment in this case. Uh, so why is it especially slow? I mean, a lot of people said that, well, we have this indirect, uh, indirect block now. We have to access that extra thing, right? So it's more expensive. And I, I think that, that, again, was an answer I would accept and probably like maybe write a note grumbling about it. Uh, I was grumbling about it because FFS will put the indirect block and it'll try to put the indirect block in the inode and all those data blocks in the same group, right? So sure, you have to ac <coughs> access one more block, uh, but is it really that expensive? I mean, it'll probably be fairly sequential since it's in the same group, right? What, what I was really looking for here is that FFS, I mean, it can't put all data next to all other data, right? Because all data is related. So it has to split it up and it splits it up uh, either when you are creating a new directory, or when you have these uh, five, when you have these blocks that are, are pointed to by indirects, right? If you have a large file, it point, puts any blocks that are pointed to by an indirect in a separate block group, right? So accessing the indirect won't be that expensive here, but what, what will be very expensive is that the last data block of this file will be in a different block group, right? So you're going to have to incur a random I/O, okay? So that's why it's very slow, right? So that would be an excellent answer then. Any questions on that? Okay. So this next one is again kind of related to the previous one. Right? So I mean, when, when a file is created by default, right, you don't know whether that file is going to be small or large, right? You just kind of wait until enough data is appended and then you know, right? So I mean, people do build interfaces and they use other ways to hint to the file system how large a file will be. And that's kind of what this question is about, right? Like, how could you, if you did have a hint where I'm creating a new file and I say this file is going to be large, how might you use that? Okay, so recall that FFS, it puts the first 48 kilobytes in the first group, because at that point, I mean, 
It's not trying to save those data blocks because it thinks that maybe this is a small file. But once it knows it's a big file, then it starts breaking the file into one megabyte chunks. Right? So it would actually be pretty nice if you, as soon as you knew it was going to be a large file, you broke everything into one megabyte chunks instead of having mostly one megabyte chunks and then having this small 48 kilobyte chunk. Right? So I, th I think the, the smart thing that you could do here is that as soon as you know that, uh, you should just go to another uh, block group immediately instead of wasting some of your space in the current group on this, right? Because, I mean, this would be just as fast if I put 49 kilobytes in some other block group that was mostly empty instead of putting 48 here and one in there, right? Does that make sense? Um, people had other answers, too, kind of like creative. Like, you could say, well, I mean, some people would write answers assuming that you don't know what, you don't just know whether it'll be large or small, but say that you know exactly how large it will be. Um, I mean, I guess that wasn't really the question, but I kind of, uh, I would give most or all the points for that if, if you kind of were articulate about it. Uh, because, I mean, so some things might, people might say is that if you know exactly how big it, it would be, you could look for enough uh, consecutive data to start with, right? You could look for a big stretch in your bitmaps uh, and, and have a less fragmented file. And also you wouldn't have to pre-allocate that, right? So I think that was a, that was a fine answer. So any other, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so these last last two questions are kind of related. So the name of the game is, right, is that we want to put data adjacent on disk that's going to be accessed together, right? Because that's going to decrease randomness for future reads, right? So the way FFS figures that out is it guesses. It says if these two files are in the same directory, uh, they're related. Otherwise, uh, they're not. And we'll try to put them far away from each other. Uh, but you can imagine cases where that would be wrong, right? Like a, an application will typically save its data in a bunch of different directories, and every time you run that application, it might access many of these different files. Right? So the idea here is instead of having, having uh, the file system guess, why don't we just have the application tell us if it wants to, right? I mean, it says it may request. I mean, a lot of people said, well, it should be optional. I mean, the question kind of already implies that this is an optional, uh, optional API. Right? You can either have the FFS guess or you can tell it. Um, so, I mean, the, the advantages are kind of obvious, right? Like for that application I described, you could get a speed up for that. <coughs> um, when is it, uh, when is it, what is a disadvantage? Uh, I, I think a lot of people said, well, I mean, it, it takes a lot of um, knowledge to really get this right. I mean, maybe, maybe applications themselves might get it wrong. Or you could even imagine cases where uh, programmers kind of shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, I guess that's kind of reasonable, so I, I think I was generous towards that answer. Other answers that I was maybe a little less generous for, but were kind of okay, is they said, well, what if, what if the program is malicious? Uh, I didn't really like that answer because in a file system already, you have all these different directories. And if the application can choose which directory you put it in, I mean, if you're just trying to create a slow layout, I don't feel like you need to have this API to create a slow layout, right? I mean... If I put in different directories, my data will also get spread around, right? And it's not clear what your incentive would be to um, to try to try to create a, uh, create files with a slow layout, right? I mean, if you're reading them back yourself, you're only hurting yourself. And if somebody else is reading those files, uh, you could probably do something a lot more malicious by putting some garbage in them, right? So I don't know. I, I don't find the malicious program case too compelling, but I think I would give a fair amount of points for that. Uh, so okay. So what what do I think is the real problem here? So thinking at a bigger level, right, we want to figure out which group these should go in, and you need to have knowledge to do that, right? The applications have some knowledge. The applications have a better idea what they're going to do in the future, but the file systems also have some knowledge that the applications do not. In particular, uh, FFF is, is trying to put data in blocks where there's a lot of free space, right? So the fi fast file system knows something that a applications don't. So kind of the disadvantage of using this interface is that we only use the user space knowledge and none of the kernel knowledge. Whereas the old way, we're only using the kernel knowledge and no user space knowledge. So what I'd be very happy with is if somebody came up with a solution where you could kind of use, uh, use both of those things, right? Yeah, so the disadvantage then is, so what would be in a case where uh, you, the user space does something bad because it doesn't know what the kernel knows? Well, you might try to request to put everything in a group that's already very full, right? I mean, that would be kind of a bad decision 
But in user space, you don't know that, right? So I think, for example, one interface is that you can try to just expose that information, right? You could uh, ask the file system, uh, ask the file system how full is a given block group, or you could even say, suggest me a block group that's pretty empty. Um, other people had very nice uh, ideas where the interface would be a little bit different. Instead of you specifying the exact block group you want, you would just specify another file and say, I want to be near that file. In that case, the file system has some more flexibility, right? Because it can try to uh, just treat these things as being uh, local, but it wouldn't have to... Uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't be stuck with trying to put everything in a particular directory, a group, right? It could try to put these things in the same group, but not necessarily in the same place. Uh, or not, not necessarily in a particular... It would try to put them in the same group, but not necessarily a particular group. Sorry. Uh, and then other people had other ideas where you could, say, have <coughs> tags on your files and say, like, oh, everything of the same tag is related. And then that would still give the file system a lot of flexibility, but still give the file system um, all the knowledge. Right? So, I mean, all these interfaces kind of have uh, two things in common, right? You're kind of getting all the knowledge of both user space and the kernel in the same place. In kind of the first case where I was imagining the kernel exposes more information, you're getting all the knowledge in user space and then the, the application decides which group. Or these other interfaces I've just described where you are saying tagging your files, that gives all the, that puts all the knowledge in the kernel, right? So I think both of those are, are fine ideas. Um, so I guess that's the end of it. So People should come and, I mean, if you, if you feel you should have gotten more points on something, that's definitely we should, something we should talk about, because, I mean, it's hard, this is kind of an open-ended exam, right? So it's hard to get it right, and sometimes I didn't understand what people were saying. Sometimes I couldn't even read your handwriting, right? So, I mean, if you, if, if I didn't understand your handwriting and you bring it to me and say that I said this, like, uh, we can do a regrade. Um, and, and also, right, I think their last, last exam, there were a lot of times when people said that uh, they would compare with their friends and they'd say, oh, like this, my friend got a higher grade on this. And, but I had a similar answer that they would come and I would explain the differences of the answer. So I think uh, it's useful to come and talk, right? Because either you might learn something or if I was unfair, we can fix that. So that's it.